Can I ask you why you chose raw feeding? Uh, I'll tell you why I didn't to start with, because somebody told me I should feed my dog raw chicken wings, and obviously as a vet, I knew that was terribly bad for them, would puncture their guts and probably kill them. Um, but I was persuaded in the end by my colleague to do that, because he explained actually all dogs throughout history for eight million years would have it has been have been eating raw bones so I started with my own dogs and my goodness me they didn't die and their sort of poos became a bit firmer and then I started doing it with trusted clients and in the end I had four freezers out the back of my surgery turning out about a ton of chicken wings a month and a ton of ready prepared bone organs and meat and there was only two firms in those days that used to make the raw dog oh, food oh wow so you are right in the avant-garde I was right at the beginning, yes. And just let's remind everybody, how long ago was this? I think it was probably 25 years ago would be my guess. It became clear so quickly that you'd put a dog onto what they now call a species-specific diet, yep. which, let's face it, makes sense because it's evolved for 8 million years to survive on that. And before, before it was a dog, before it was a pre-dog evolutionary. That's what they evolved to eat. So it's not like some hippie thing saying, oh, give them something natural. Give them something natural because their whole bodies have evolved to deal with that for millions and millions and millions of years. And then you give them something totally unnatural and they get ill. And the reason I kept doing it is people consistently came back and said their dog was brighter. And the coat is probably the thing you see changing the first, though maybe if I lived with a dog, I might see its character change first, I don't know. But they come back and they look brighter they're sort of more alive. Are you an advocate of raw feeding? And if so, why? Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, biologically appropriate feeding, okay? So <laughs> it's all about making sure that when you're feeding your pet, that you're thinking about the background to that. Yep. And people will say, oh, well, your dog, it's not a wolf anymore. You know, things have moved on. We're doing so much more to feed it. But actually, if you go back to the anatomy and the physiology, Actually, very little has changed. You know, you've got a jaw that cannot dislocate and grind from side to side. How on earth is that going to digest vegetable matter? There might be throwbacks to enzymes, you know, within the gut because of the genetic makeup that allow it, because it's a mammalian species, to actually, yes, propose that it could make an enzyme that could digest, you know, plant material. However, how is that enzyme going to act if it can't actually access those components of the vegetable matter and if the teeth aren't there to break it down you know cats and dogs don't swallow nice soft little boluses of food you know they tear chunks and swallow big bits the that's, inhaler. that's the way that they're designed <laughs> you know even the little chihuahua does not have the ability to dislocate its jaw and start chewing from side to side so it has to chomp chomp swallow that's all it can do so ultimately, you've got to think biologically appropriate. I, you are totally speaking our language. There's two things we've been trying to do, which is implement and involve green tripe in every meal, simply because it's so rich in digestive enzymes, and we find a super high source of that. The other thing is, we've been including a, a specific type of vegetable, uh, low lectin vegetable in our foods. Why? not to feed the dog but to feed its microbiome mm -hmm. because we're seeing some studies where there's a huge amount of longevity implied with certain types of gut bacteria but that's maybe another conversation it's a really interesting thing that you raise about you know the microbiome and the interest in health i mean that's something that's become very popular in the human sphere at the moment uh, yep. and it just implements why the microbiome is actually so important to your core health and actually looking at the health of that will reflect upon your general health. Yes. So, you know, there's some great stuff in all the way from mental health all the way through to chronic disease. So it's really, you know, really topical. Um, and I think we've got to understand that their microbiome is not the same as ours. Oh, totally. So, so many people will start throwing in, you know, the cl classic lactobacilli and thinking, that's it. That's all we need to do. It's not quite the same. It's, it's very um, different, I but agree. There are lots of studies coming through about the differences, not just what you can culture from the gut, 
but what you can actually see in the gut lining all the way through to the lumen of the gut for what makes up those bacterial interactions. And all of those release little chemicals, which are like hormones, which have interactions with the rest of your body, um, that has an effect. And that's why they call it a second genome, because it's a load of non-animal um, genetic code that's being used and symbiotically working together to create health. Yeah. I mean, in fact, somebody threw an incredible stat at me the other day that actually 99% of the genetic material in ours and a dog's body is in fact foreign. Absolutely, yeah. It's uh, just an amazing amount. I mean, they do say that if you took a human and you took out all of the non-human material in there, you'd have a thing the size of a football, on average, for a human, that is totally non-human made, made up material. So it's just a, a quite a big section but you've got to remember all of those organisms are much smaller than the human cells but they contain massive amounts of genetic code yes and it's the genetic diversity and coding that's within that football of material that actually makes up the the information now this leads on to a really relevant question and a lot of people have been asking this yeah. is that I think that lots of people are really interested to try raw feeding, but they might be dissuaded by a, their own vet, uh -huh. uh, who is obviously very well intentioned and everybody is actually operating from a place of animal care yes. and wishing to do the best. Very much so. Why is it that you think some vets might be anti-raw? And the second part of this is, what should we be doing to help rise this tide and create some you know, positive movement? Yeah, yeah. Um, the I find most vets who are anti it don't know really much about it. Yeah, it's, raw food is not as yet taught in uh, in, in vet schools. Um, although I do go up to Glasgow every year and talk to the second year vet students there. Oh, so, so it's really good, really, really good. It's becoming um, slightly more mainstream. It's, then. it's it's becoming less fringy. Okay, less fringy. Uh, so uh, most vets that I talk to. Once they know that you are not going to be doing anything uh, strange or dangerous with the dog, they're very happy to pass on a case to, to me as a veterinary surgeon um, to guide the, guide the client. Okay, So I think if, if your vet is very, very, very anti, um, I think you need to have a conversation with them. If you can't make progress then I think maybe find another team who can work more along the lines that you actually want to work. Is there any particular feeding methodology you would recommend and can I ask why? Yes, I think I think the word is species appropriate isn't it? Um, quite a while ago I came across the concept of raw feeding. Um, I spent a bit of time working in Australia with uh, um, Tom Lonsdale who was very much a sort of pioneer of, of the raw meaty bones diet and also uh, with um, the author of uh, the Bath diet basically um, whose name escapes me for the moment and it will come back um, but probably 20 years ago I got involved in the concept of um, raw feeding Ian Billinghurst um, and uh, I've sort of pursued it ever since. There's a, a concept in homeopathy of obstacles to cure. Um, Samuel Hahnemann in paragraph three of the Organon states that it's important to remove obstacles to cure and it became clear early on in my homeopathic career that if uh, that modern feeding methods were an obstacle to cure and, and needed to be um, altered and, and raw feeding is the way that animals should be fed or the, the pet animals I deal with, um, mainly dogs and cats. Um, their natural diet is meat, bones and a bit of veggie stuff, um, but basically raw feeding. Tremendous. And just to clarify, obstacle to cure, basically what we're saying is it's very difficult to heal the animal if it's not on a species appropriate diet or if it's not being raw fed. Absolutely. Because it's getting basically a huge stress load from processed food. Yeah, 